Hey everyone, just a quick warning, this episode does have explicit language. It may not be appropriate for kids. How many other people were involved in this crime? Off the top of my head, I can't recall. Um, there were, that day, there were um, two people involved, the day of the crime. That's the voice of Detective Tim Bazell. Were any of the other people involved ever arrested? No, <clears throat> they were, <clears throat> we interviewed them. Um, the two the two that helped out that day actually gave statements. Um, charges were submitted. We should pause here to reinforce what Bazell just said. I'd been operating under the assumption this entire time that Curcio was the only person ever charged with this crime. But that's not exactly correct. Bazell and the Monroe Police Department did submit charges against the getaway driver and the lookout. But nothing happened. The um, federal prosecutor decided not to follow through. So I went to um, our county prosecutor and gave it all the whole case to him. And they reviewed the whole thing and goes, federal prosecutor should have prosecuted him. All right, I'm going to pause here again because Detective Bazell is a matter-of-fact guy and has a way of understating things in a way that makes them seem way less wild than they actually are. See, when the federal prosecutor declined to bring charges against the accomplices in federal court, Bazell then took the entire case and brought it back to the Snohomish County Prosecutor's Office to try and get them to take up the case. And they didn't. They didn't want to step on toes, maybe, or figured it wasn't that strong a case. Whatever the reason, they decided not to prosecute. And Bazell didn't have to do that. I talked to a couple of attorneys who told me that when the feds declined to prosecute anyone other than Curcio, Bazell could have walked away and no one would have said anything. But he didn't. He rebuilt his case and brought it to the state prosecutors. They just didn't do anything. And so at that point, I have no recourse. I can, there's nothing else I can do. I've given it to the federal prosecutor for prosecution. I've given it to the, our county prosecutor um, and, and asked them. So you disagree with the decision not to pro prosecute? Right. My name is Nate Scott. I'm a reporter and editor at For the Win and USA Today Sports. This is The Sneak. Anthony Curcio's attorney, Jeffrey Cradle, had a similar idea about what happened. I think once a case goes off the state plate, onto the federal plate, even when the feds try to put some part of it back on the state for them to do something, it's not necessarily going to happen. And I don't think anybody was motivated at the Snohomish County Prosecutor's Office to figure out what they did or did not have to be able to prosecute um, other people involved in this. And so it just, just never got charged. I emailed Judge Janice Ellis, who was the prosecutor for Snohomish County in 2008, about this decision, but have not heard back. I also asked Assistant U.S. Attorney Bruce Miyake, the prosecutor for this case in federal court, why he didn't prosecute the accomplices. He did answer. Do you remember the government's dis decision not to prosecute those, those uh, people who had aided and, and helped Anthony? Yeah, yeah, we we did, we decided not to because when we contacted them, they immediately uh, agreed to cooperate with us. Um, there was one that we were considering uh, prosecuting, and that was the person that was the getaway driver. We ultimately decided not to not to uh, prosecute uh, that person. Do you remember why that decision was made? Because of his cooperation with us. This all brings us back to J.J., the man that Anthony alleges helped him plan the robbery, the one who cooperated with the prosecutor. If you remember from last episode, we were able to figure out J.J.'s real name because it was revealed publicly in a legal filing. See, when Curcio's attorney, Jeffrey Cradle, realized that the government was going to charge Anthony alone, he knew he needed to do something to protect his client. He knew he needed to get J.J.'s name in the record. We found a court document submitted by your office, which actually uh, does name 
JJ, and I'm, I'm not going to say his name here because I have not decided if we're going to, to name him either yet. Um, sure. But, but that name was made public. Why was it important for you to get that name out there as an, as I believe you refer to him, an unindicted co-conspirator? Um, one of the factors in federal court in determining an appropriate sentence, there's a statute, 18 U.S.C. 3553, and one of the factors that a court takes into account is whether similarly situated um, people who've committed similar acts, what level of punishment they got. So in a drug conspiracy, if there's two people who were middle-level managers and one got a sentence of three years in prison and the prosecutor is asking for six years, for my client, I'm going to be pointing out that the other person only got three. And pointing out that to the degree that anybody was trying to portray how serious this was and how much punishment was warranted, that they were essentially giving a pass to people who had been integral to the commission of it was something I wanted the courts to take into account. Jeffrey Cradle made the argument that two people planned a robbery and one got off with no punishment, which begs the question, what is fair for the guy who did get punished? At the end of September, my co-producer Pat took a few-week vacation to Europe. When he got back, we had a phone call to catch up. Hey, Nate. How you doing? Good, man. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. So, you've been gone for a while. Stuff has happened. Uh, I found everyone. Did you? Yes. I found JJ, I found the lookout, I found the driver, I found the guy who uh, helped him buy the Range Rover, I found the guy who helped him clear the river for the jet ski. They, they, they talk? Uh, one, sort of. <laughs> wow. I got to tell you how I found him because I'm, I'm proud of it. So everyone's identified by the initials. As you know, right in the in the legal docs, we took his initials. I don't know if you remember the uh, mentioned that a current guy works, and I'll bleep this out. But he works at. Forgive the bleeping here, but we want to protect the source and the identity of the accomplice. Right, right. He was a. Yes. So I took the initials. And I went to the online employee directory and I went name by name and there was only one name in the directory (laughs) that matched the initials of the person uh, that was named in the document. Wow. So I got him that way. I emailed him and he emailed me back. But I emailed him on his work email, and I was trying to be sensitive to that. So I said, hey, you should give me a call. And he said, why do I need to call you? And I said, well, this is concerning someone whose initials are AC, and I'm trying to be sensitive to your work email. And he replied, uh, I don't remember, I can find the exact language, but it was something like, thank you for being sensitive to my work. Uh, I'll call you tonight no calls, and now I've emailed multiple times, no response, scared off. Mm. I mean, JJ has a number disconnected. I'm going to call the attorney. Have you, have you been able to run them through like LexisNexis at all and see if you can get phone numbers? LexisNexis is a high-powered online database that researchers, journalists, and investigators use. So yes, driver called Two numbers connected to that name, nothing. It's got all landlines, and no one uses a landline anymore. I think they all, everyone signs up for them, and then they don't actually use them. Right. JJ's gone. Gone, huh? Just, like, uh, everyone else, like, footprint, you know, hard to find, not responding to me, but, like, has a has a footprint. JJ, gone. Disappeared. I mean, I'm calling his attorney from 10 years ago, who... I doubt is keeping who's maintaining that relationship. I mean, 
he might have something, but huh? Words probably out on the street among all of them that hey, there's this thing. <laughs> that has to be it, right? So we know who helped Anthony Curcio, and none of them want to talk to us. You may be asking why we went on this hunt, why we spent so long tracking these people down. It's a fair question, and I'll admit part of it was just good old-fashioned curiosity. I wanted to know more, and part of it sure was fun. It was like a grand mystery only we knew about and only we could solve. But I also wanted to understand the pull Anthony had over these people, I wanted to know how involved they really were, how much they knew and when they knew it. And lastly, I wanted to know what they'd done with their second chance. Was anyone else ever indicted? No. They call them. They're named in my paperwork as unindicted co-conspirators. So yeah. it's like, you know, these people. And, you know, I, I, I'm fine with that. I am totally fine with that. Anthony has followed up with these people, though. He's kept an eye on them. The, the ones that changed their lives, oh, I have absolutely no ill will towards at all. At all. Then even the ones that did, uh, you know, continue doing this shit. It's like, really, I just, I don't want anything to do with them. That's it. I mean, it's like, it's sad that they didn't change their life and it's really frustrating. And I wish I could be like, dude, what the fuck? You don't know how big a second chance you got? Like, why didn't you change? We're going to go back now to my conversation with Curcio's attorney, Jeffrey Cradle. We were talking about the federal prosecutor's decision not to charge anyone else. And then he mentioned something, kind of out of the blue. I could be wrong about this, but my guess is that the Monroe Police Department was very interested in having other people, and in particular J.J., prosecuted for their involvement. I will say that Detective Bazell seems like that part of it still eats at him a little bit. Yeah. Well, that's, you, you've probably figured this out. All those folks, they all know each other. <laughs> they all have known each other for a long time. And that's the, the other component of this that didn't really get that much um, focus by the media at the time was how it isn't just a story of the police from Monroe investigating a guy from Monroe. I mean, these are people who they went to school with. They went to school with brothers and sisters of each other. They, I mean, they all, they all know each other. See, this is also why I was so driven to find all the other people involved in this case. I wanted to better understand the town of Monroe and how it reckoned with what happened. There was an intimacy to this crime. These were locals, guys who had grown up there. Remember Mitch Ruth, the realtor who was the eyewitness to the crime? I asked him about this. I won't ask you to name any names, but this is a small town. Do people know who else was involved in this? Um, I believe that's very likely. <laughs> Somewhat common knowledge? I would say that is probably likely. As you can probably tell, Mitch was choosing his words very carefully here, but he was nodding as he said them. Uh, and these people remain parts of the community. Correct. And you do feel that Anthony was mostly responsible for this? I don't have an opinion on that. I don't know who was mostly responsible because I don't have those facts. Yeah. But you're okay with him having served the time he served. He was the guy who grabbed the bag. This is true. Uh, I know he wasn't alone, but uh, you know, I'm fine with that. I'm, I'm not the arbiter of that. Yeah. So, so I'm okay with that. Do you think it's interesting that the story, I mean, even the D.B. Tuber, D.B. Cooper acted alone. D.B. Tuber, you know. Did that, he? Well, we don't know. Right. Let's go back to Detective Bazell. 
any of the other co-conspirators who were not arrested for that, have they popped up on your radar in the intermittent years? Just for regular Monroe stuff, because they're still here in Monroe. Several of them are still here in Monroe, so they, they pop off just for normal stuff, nothing, nothing criminal. Yeah. Just around. I'll say hi to them. Yeah. And they know? Yeah, they know. I mean, I interviewed them. They know I know what they did. Um, but they'll still say, say hi to me. Yeah. Has the statute of limitations passed? They're, they're in the clear? They... Yeah, they're good. They're clear. But you know. I know. And they know. So in the end, we found everyone. We know all their names. And again, I'm not going to share them here. Why? Well, mostly because I didn't get into this to destroy lives. Whether you think they're culpable or not, these guys got away with it. And I'm not here to publicly humiliate them. And again, the feds and state decided not to prosecute. I will say, their names? They are out there. If you want to find out who they are, you can find out. Might take a little time, require some detective work, but you can figure out who helped Anthony Curcio. Or, and this is maybe simpler, you can just go to Monroe, Washington, walk into a local bar, buy someone a beer, and ask them. Because that's the thing. In Monroe, just about everyone knows who was involved in the robbery of that Brinks truck and they know which people got away with it. Hey, Nate, how you doing? Pat, I'm well. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. What's, uh, what's the latest? You know the guy last week, the one who uh, got scared off? Uh-huh. He got unscared off. Oh. For the first time in 11 years, one of the people who allegedly helped Anthony Curcio was ready to talk. The Sneak is a project of For the Win and USA Today Sports. It is produced by myself, along with Anthony Pacillo and Pat Shanahan. Audio engineering and sound design from Chris Bauerbank, and our sound recordist is Josh Savare. Research and additional production from Daniela Schneider. Our executives are Kate Gutman and Mark Hyland. Thanks to Emmanuel Lozano, Joe Myers, and the Monroe Police Department. Hey, sports fans, if you want to see more videos like this, check out some of our other ones right here. And if you like what you see, hit the subscribe button and stick around for more from USA Today Sports.